I am your host, Nicole Will, and we're so happy you're here as we navigate the world with your aging loved one. We are here to come alongside older adults, family members, and the senior living community as we explore the world of aging and elder care with helpful resources, informative interviews, and approachable conversations. We get to do this together, so join us on our journey, and this is the Will Gather Podcast. We live in a world where youth is envied, we are told to age gracefully, we are sold wrinkle creams and injections, but in fact, aging is something we are doing every day. The act of growing old and everything with it is one of our most treasured experiences as a human being. How do we shift our mindset around this? How can we go deep and find out exactly who we are and embrace the process of getting older? My guest today, Kathy. Kathleen O'Brien is the author of Reclaim Your Right to Grow Old. She has researched aging for over 13 years, has taught classes about growing older through the University of Denver, and writes regular blogs at growoldbehappy.com. I loved my conversation with her today. I learned so much. My perspective has already shifted in such a short amount of time to really embrace this time in our life, to look at growing older as a gift. Kathleen is so sweet and smart and articulate and has a personal passion for sharing with all of us how we can really find happiness in aging. Here is my interview with Kathleen. We're so happy we get to visit with her today and talk about this whole philosophy of aging and reclaiming this time in our life. So Kathleen, thank you so much. Welcome. Well, thank you, Nicole. Nicole, for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. I am too. I am too. And you have such an interesting story and history that brought you to where you are today. Tell us about that. Well, it really was the aging process itself. When I was about to turn 60, this was 13 years ago, it's hard to believe, (laughs) but I began to look around and think, you know, I really am hitting a milestone here at 60. What does this mean to me? How do I feel about going forward in a culture that doesn't, not only doesn't particularly like the idea of aging, but doesn't seem to respect older people? I thought there must be a way to age where I don't feel I have to try to maintain youth forever because that's really a losing proposition. I can't go backward. I can only go forward. So I started doing some research, Nicole, and I decided I was going to look um, at generations past and even go back to ancient philosophers to find out what has aging meant to humanity through the centuries. And what I found out was pretty startling. It isn't about being young forever. It isn't about chasing after those years that are gone by, uh, trying to keep up with younger people. Being older was a mantle of accomplishment in so many ancient societies. This is what people looked forward to. And in some respects, they couldn't wait to be the elder in the community, the person that people looked up to. And what I also found was that modern gerontologists, those who are doing research on the cutting edge, we're kind of coming to these same conclusions, saying, no, getting older is a special time. It's not about chasing after your former youthful self. It's about enjoying things that only maturity, perspective, and wisdom can really bring us. So when I began to see all of that, I thought, well, maybe I can age the way the ancients suggested and also the way modern gerontologists uh, encourage us to do. So I started teaching some classes on my research through the University of Denver's continuing education program and had a really good response. 
Uh, and at one point, someone or several people said, why don't you write a book about this and put your philosophy into it? And I thought, well, uh, you know, writing is sort of, it's always sort of been my basic skill. I started my career as an advertising copywriter. So I thought, well, maybe I should be doing this. So that's when I began that long process of putting my research together with interviews with people and then my own personal anecdotes about aging and what it has meant to me. Yes. I think we learn so much from our history and people that have gone before us. You talked about how you looked at those ancient philosophies and cultures. Is there one that stood out to you that like, man, they really got it right. They really revered those older adults in their life. Well, I think one of the cultures I continue to look back to uh, is uh, sort of embodied in the Hindu religion, which really began in certainly in Eastern cultures and manifests itself so beautifully in India. But what they talked about were the stages of the human life cycle, which I think we've sort of forgotten that it's, it's, we're not the same person we were when we were a child. The whole idea of, according to Hindus, the whole idea of life is to, it's sort of a learning process. Mm. And they have four stages, Nicole, of uh, the human life cycle. Generally, they refer to four. The first is childhood, where you take everything in. The second is what they call householder which is really adulthood, where you take care of people, you take care of your parents, you take care of your children, you go out in the world and make your mark. And then you transition into the next stage, which is the beginning of elderhood. And this is where Hindus advise older people to step back. Mm. You don't have to be in the fray anymore. You don't have to take on the responsibilities of a householder anymore. You need to sort of um, reflect upon yourself and do what pleases you. Mm -hmm. And then the final stage is elderhood, where people come to you for advice. And also, and according to Hindus who believe in reincarnation, whether you do or not, Mm -hmm. they feel that that's a time to prepare for your next life. Mm So they really seem to understand that there is a cycle of life and that that each stage is important, Mm -hmm. but one stage is not more important than the other. Elderhood and being older takes up two of the four stages in the Hindu life cycle. And I think that's something we can learn from. I feel like we're constantly fighting growing older, (laughs) right? All of the messaging, all of our advertising, our whole world is the the pursuit of youth and, and wanting to maintain that. And also within that, not necessarily revering our older adults and taking on the wisdom. So I really appreciate looking at other cultures and seeing what can we learn from them? What can we gleam and implement? those even small, you know, start small and start changing our mindset around aging and growing older. We have a term aging gracefully that we like to use quite often and we hear it so, so often in advertising and various things. And you talk about not necessarily using that terminology. And why do you recommend, why do you recommend that? Well, to me, the idea of aging gracefully, as soon as you say that, it makes it sound like there's something wrong with aging. Yeah. You don't ask a child to be a child gracefully. You (laughs) don't ask a a young adult to, you know, go out in the world, but do it gracefully. Right. Um, So what it sort of implies is growing old is not a great thing. It's not an attractive thing. Mm -hmm. So the very least you can do is be graceful (laughs) about it. Well, I say fooey. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with aging. It is the most natural process that humans go through. Mm -hmm. And also the idea of aging, it's almost when you say 
I want to age gracefully. It's like you're doing it for someone else. I, I don't want to offend anybody by aging naturally. I, I want to be, I want to tiptoe around and pretend in some respect it isn't happening. Or these physical changes aren't real. Well, they are real. And I think people have to understand this is part, again, of the human life cycle. So I don't like that term, <laughs> aging gracefully. I think the term grace or having grace is a, it's a beautiful word, but I don't think we should expect older people to try to mitigate their experience because it's making younger people uh, unhappy. Oh, I don't want to be with older people. I don't like older people because they remind me that I'm going to get old someday. And of course, they remind you of the ultimate uh, actual goal of human existence is death. I mean, it had birth and death, and they were they are equally important. I don't think we give enough importance to the process of dying. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all sort of tied together. Like you said, our culture doesn't want to face this. We don't want to face the reality of what it means to be human. And so we don't really respect that part of the human life cycle, the aging part, where there are so many cultures who do uh, respect it. And I think, like you said, we can learn from them. Having conversations like this, having your book out into the world, I think that is the start of hopefully our shift of thinking about growing older, aging, what that looks like. Do you feel like we're moving in more of that direction of, ex not acceptance, em embracing excitement or uh, I'm trying to think of off the cuff of my mind here <laughs> thinking of some of those terms as we as we really embrace it and and hold respect around it. I think things are getting a little better. I'm beginning to see sort of the uh, emergence of uh, a feeling that being older is beginning to become okay. There are a lot of pro-aging groups around the country that are beginning to pop up. There are even some advertisers who have backed away a little bit uh, in calling their products anti-aging. Uh, some people who make, for instance, cosmetics are calling them in some respect pro-aging. So that all that is to the good. And we do see celebrities and people we hold in esteem for, for good or ill, but these are people who are out there that we see all the time who are aging actors or aging uh, artists. Uh, and they often talk about being elders now. And, and I don't remember hearing that so much, maybe 10, 20 years ago. So I think the good news, Nicole, is that yes, I think some of this message is beginning to get out. And I do think in part, it is because the baby boomers who I am on the leading edge of that, I think the oldest baby boomer now is probably 75. They were born in 1946, I was born in 48. But there, and it goes back to 1964. These are all considered baby boomers. Well, they're all getting older. I mean, they're all 60s and 70s. And um, so I think you're going to see a little shift in the tide. And frankly, I think we as older people, as elders can help that along by not buying in to what society says about staying young for a, forever, but immersing ourselves in the aging process and embracing the perspective, the wisdom and maturity that you can only get when you've lived a number of years. So true. You talk about that obsession we have in our culture with holding on to our youth. Why do you think that is? Well, I, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think part of it is we are, um, we are a consumer society. Mm. And we also are a society that's kind of a can-do culture, which is to 
our advantage. I mean, you always think of Americans as they can do anything. They can go out there and solve the problems of the world. Um, so when we think about that, what do we think about? We think about younger people, you know, taking taking on the banner of, of making everything good and, and getting out there and being first at everything we do. So when we put so much emphasis on that, I think that part of the thinking that goes along with that is that, well, where do older people fit in? Mm -hmm. They're not out there in the forefront mm -hmm. for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so are they valuable? I think that's part of the message. Mm -hmm. I also think being a consumer society, there are a lot of products, anti-aging products you can sell mm -hmm. to older people. I mean, there are 76 million baby boomers mm -hmm. and that's, all, that's a big market. Right. For somebody. There's a lot of uh, money involved. <laughs> there is definitely money involved. And so what what can we sell to them? We can sell to them everything from teeth whitening to um, tummy tucks, mm -hmm. you know, to facelifts and wrinkle creams to um, sports cars so that they look young when they're driving around. I mean, you, you know, you can you can make a case, I guess, as a manufacturer of these goods that this is where everybody wants to be. And what I'm saying is it's not where everybody wants right. to be. If you really want to age with less stress mm -hmm. and age naturally, mm -hmm. you don't have to buy into all these things. I mean, if you want to, fine. If you want to buy a sports car, yeah, buy it. Buy but it. don't feel you have to do that in order to impress everyone that you are, quote, still young. Because you know what? You're not. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I don't. I try to look at myself and think, well, you're pretty fit. You know, you're active and all of that. But the point is, I'm 73. Mm -hmm. I am not 33. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at some point you... <laughs> have to be at peace with that. Well, yes, and think of so, how much energy it takes to yes. always feel like we're not measuring up or need to do the next thing. I mean, that's really exhausting. Well, it's exhausting. And I also think, you know, everyone ages differently. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are so many studies that have proven that uh, kindergartners are much more alike than 85 year olds. If you get a room full of 85 year olds, they're very different. Mm. They're very different in how they're aging. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who have physical and cognitive challenges, and we can't see them as lesser than someone who, for whatever reason, and a lot of it's genetic, yeah. but it can be genetic, it can be lifestyle, for whatever reason, they seem to be quote unquote younger. Mm -hmm. Well, they're just aging differently. Mm -hmm. So we have to have respect for how everyone ages, even if they have difficulties, even if they have physical, as I said, or cognitive difficult difficulties, mm -hmm. we have to respect them. They have given a lot to this world. They have given a lot to their families. We need to respect what they have imparted to us mm -hmm. and accept them no matter where they are right now, uh, physically, cognitively, or emotionally. There's something to be said about really taking the time to hear those stories and understand all that was contributed, whether it was to their family, to the world, to science. I had a lot of really good conversation. I worked in a senior living community previously, mm -hmm. and one of my favorite things to do when I had time, you know, extra time on my hands there was just to sit down and ask all those questions and, and hear history through their eyes and understand a little bit more about their life and what that was like, right? Because I am a little bit younger and so I didn't have the privilege of walking through those years at the same time that they did. And that was so meaningful. And I think just a call to people to 
not be afraid to ask all those questions and have conversation and know that those those histories and stories are so valuable. Yeah, they do. You know, there are what I like to call enduring cultures where uh, I'm thinking African uh, cultures, Native American, and certainly Eastern cultures, where the elder is considered the guardian of, of the rights of the culture, of the the history of it. And this is your, what you were getting, Nicole, was firsthand knowledge. This isn't something that someone wrote and researched, which is fine. I mean, I wrote and researched my book, so I'm not taking anything away from that. But when you actually hear from people who lived through it and their remembrances and what was important to them and what stuck with them, This is such a valuable treasure for all of us to have this wonderful knowledge because we can learn from it. I mean, yes, the world moves on, but in some respects, human beings have always kind of been the same. So if you can glean something from someone older to make your life a little better, oh gosh, why not do it? It's there and we just need to participate in it and learn from it so much, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. That must have been a great time for you to have spent with all those older folks. I can't even imagine. Yeah, I I truly loved every minute of it. It was just just wonderful and and I took away so much anything from history personal history but also recipes oh. <laughs> one of my favorites I, I still make my pot roast um, based on one of my former residents um, her her pot roast trick so uh, do you feel like part of it too of aging for people and and having fear around it is the unknown you mentioned there's that statement fear of the unknown is a great motivator what are your thoughts about that yeah I think um one of the greatest fears ultimately that humans have and and it manifests itself differently and and a lot of different cultures. But of course, it's the fear of death. Mm. uh, Because we are really the only sentient being who knows he or she is going to die, at least from the research that's been done. We're the ones who know, right? So, you know, there is kind of this fear of death, which I think is more omnipresent in our culture and Western culture than maybe some others. But when we don't know what awaits us, the unknown, you know, what's it going to be like as we get very old? What's, what will death be like? What, you know, how do I feel about all of that? I think in some ways that can be a great motivator because what it does is it reminds us that time is finite. Mm -hmm. And think about it. I mean, if you were here and you had forever, I mean, you'd sort of be at loose ends, like, well, what do I do? Uh, Should I be doing anything? If I've got an endless life, then just, I mean, you're almost sort of aimless in a way. Right. But but having a, a finite amount of time, and as you get older, you see, you see that it really is very finite. That kind of focuses you. Well, okay, I have so many weeks left, hours left on this earth, what am I going to do with them? What is really important to me? Not how can I prove that I'm still young or how can I go out and make more money even though you know I have a comfortable life? No, no, that's not really what it's about. The, the questions I think people should be asking is what? not what do I want to accomplish, but what really interests me? Mm. What are some of the big questions I want to answer before my time is up? Questions like, who am I? Mm -hmm. Uh, How do I fit into uh, the rest of the world or the cosmos itself? How do I feel about religion or spirituality? Mm -hmm. These are very big questions, but they're important. And I think older people have the opportunity to answer them in ways Mm -hmm. younger people with a lot less experience Mm -hmm. uh, can do. So I think the fears sometimes motivate us Mm -hmm. to focus in a little bit more and maybe 
get uh, you know get our priorities straight. And and I don't know that that the culture helps us with that. Frankly, I know. <laughs> I know. unfortunately, yeah. it's always about things like bucket lists. And you know, look, I think I think bucket lists are fine. But I always get the feeling that people have them in order to sort of one up. Yeah, <laughs> their friends like, well, <laughs> my but on my bucket list is going to the Grand Canyon. Well, on mine's going to Thailand. You yes. know, so there. Right. And then and then they cross them off so they can hurry along and move to the next thing. And I'm not sure that's is that how you want to spend your hours? I mean, maybe yeah. it is, yeah. but but maybe part of being human is kind of discovering and answering mm -hmm. <laughs> some of these bigger questions. I guess that would be how I feel. About it. What a beautiful way to state that. The bucket list too, right? Those can be really fun, but there mm -hmm. is that can be a little more competition <laughs> involved. And now with social media, here's what I'm doing. And really what it comes down to is those internal questions that you talked about. Who am I? What is the spirituality that I have? And how does that guide me through my life or my relationships and conversations? And those that's an internal job. That is not something that anyone else can necessarily contribute or or do for us. And I think there's beauty in, in walking that journey uh, on our own to get to that place where we can have total internal peace once as, as we continue to grow older. And it's so true when you were talking about that, that time is finite. And so that is so motivating. I never really looked at it in that way. So thank you for that. Oh, you're um, welcome. <laughs> it, it is, you know, when we have, let's say deadlines or, you know, I, I think I function better when I have these like little pockets of, I know this specific time, I get a lot accomplished. I know that I need to have things done. And I think we, we do start to move forward in things when we know we're not drifting aimlessly with all these days ahead of us with, with nothing to do. Yeah, it's very true. It's interesting when you were talking about going inward and, and reflecting. And I talk about it, in my philosophy and my classes and so forth, I talk about the importance of self-reflection. And it was Sigmund Freud who said, you know, it, it, and I'm paraphrasing him here, but he was basically saying, if a, a younger person is turning inward all the time and spending a lot of time on him or herself reflecting and so forth, that may not be appropriate. But he said it is more than appropriate for an older person at this time of your life to, um, to turn things inward. And as you talked about, and as I talked about as well, uh, answering some of those big questions. I think it's really important to find out as we age, how do I feel about myself? Again, who am I? But how can I become more of the authentic me? rather than the me that maybe has been out there in the workplace and uh, or even raising a family, when you let go of those responsibilities and you shine the light on yourself, I think this is, you know, coming to terms with your own humanity. This is part of what it means to live. It, <laughs> to live is not just to do, it's to be, it's to reflect, it's to contemplate and and in some respects that may be a harder task than a bucket list because it forces you to look at things you may not want to look at but i think ultimately you become more sanguine about death itself when you look at yourself and say what do i really believe and explore your own spirituality uh, if you're religious delve into that more so that you are comforted as you draw closer to death as as we all do as we age the uh, religion and spirituality are there in part to comfort you uh, i think that's one of the reasons that they've grown up in so many cultures so take advantage of that find out what you really believe and think and feel and let that guide you and let that be a source of i guess joy 
as you grow older. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I'm in those middle stages of life where I've got children and my parents and you had talked about that time where it's it's not about me so much. Mm-hmm. I'm making sure that little humans are taken care of and driving and all of that. And what a beautiful perspective to I'm embracing this time in my life, but I'm also looking forward to the time where I am able to authentically live out what I desire in the future and can be reflective and have time for myself and what I really love. Because right now that time is very few and far between, which is okay. I think also looking at some ways reconciling when we age and not having that self-betrayal. We're able to look at, okay, I've put my needs aside for a lot of years and now I have this time to you would talk you use the phrase like authentically be me and to live that out and what a beautiful thing to look forward to I think you setting us up for shifting our perspective on that is so helpful for so many people that might struggle with growing older well I think one of the reasons I wanted to teach the classes I did and do the research I mean it was partly for me certainly to make me feel better about (laughs) aging and writing the book too but You know, it was also to impart to other people, people your age and younger, that not to be afraid of growing old. And as you said, to look in some respect, to look forward to it, because it it is very freeing. It's so freeing to think I can just be who I want to be. I can wear what I want to wear. I mean, you know, I was had a number of careers and in each of them I had to dress appropriately and I was a television broadcaster so I mean I wore back then you know you wore the the blouse with the little tie and and the structured suit which wasn't me at all I'm not a structured person and you know it's so freeing to just be able to wear stuff that I like uh and I I often tell older people you can get if you want to get a tattoo get a tattoo if you want to get more piercings in your ear get one I mean who are you trying to please other than yourself and I have a good friend I I met her years ago we we're in high school together. And every time I see her, she lives out near where I do. She's got white hair and she always has purple or pink or some kind of streaks in it. And she looks so <laughs> cool and she loves it. It's who she is. I mean, she's just, she has kind of a wild way of dressing. And I love to see those bright pink streaks in her hair. She's being who she is. She is really being authentic as she has grown older. Yeah. There's nothing better than feeling like you are at home in your skin. And Oh, yes. Okay. So we want people to read this book and connect with you. Can you tell us a little bit about it and where can we learn more and find your book to purchase? Yes. Okay. Well, if you're interested in shedding some of these constraints that our society puts on us as we age, I hope I can be helpful. Um, Yeah, you can go to my website, growoldbehappy.com. That's all one word, growoldbehappy.com. And you can click on the homepage on the book and you can purchase it there. You can go to Amazon, Reclaim Your Right to Grow Old, uh, Barnes and and Noble, and uh, bookstores dotted throughout the country, and also uh, through Outskirts Press, uh, who published my book. So I also, on my website, I write regular blogs, and I have a number of podcasts that I have done and recorded, and they are up there where I've been a guest. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I also am a regular contributor contributor to one. So you'll you'll see those contributions too. And certainly being a writer, I write blogs. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody does, but when you're a writer, it's kind I of fun yes. to be able to do that. So there's a lot of information, more information about my philosophy. And I would love to hear from anyone. You can just send me a note through my website. And I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, 
Pinterest, ah, LinkedIn, yeah. you know, the whole thing. Yeah. So good. So good. So <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll have to connect there as well. And this has been just a joy. I've loved our conversation. Well, but we'll have to do it again sometime. Thank you. Oh, Nicole, I would love to do it. You've done a beautiful job with the interview and uh, and she's so attractive too. Oh. I don't know how many people can see her, <laughs> oh, but she's so really sweet. pretty. Oh, and it's been a delight to get friends. to know you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for asking me. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed our episode, please subscribe and give us five stars. (laughs) In all honesty, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening to our episode.